The thing about money is the timing of having it and needing it usually don't quite line up. Like, Paloma might have $1,000 in her wallet, but that's way too much cash to carry around. Plus, she wants it out of sight, so she stops eyeing every pretty porch furniture she doesn't need. Plus, she'd love to loan it out so she can earn a little interest as she waits. On the other hand, Joe might need more money than he has right now to buy a van to start his local bread delivery business. Once he starts peddling those loaves, he'll definitely be able to afford this very important business investment. But right now, he could really use a loan to pay back over time. Sure, Paloma could take her $1,000 and go knocking on doors through her neighborhood to find the one person who would want to borrow her money and pay her back with some interest, but that seems tedious and also a little unsafe. And Joe could call up everyone in his address book to see if anyone's looking to loan out $1,000, but that might feel a little desperate. Plus, like all millennials, he hates talking on the phone. Paloma and Joe are a match made in heaven, but first they need to meet each other. They could wait until their paths cross spontaneously but auspiciously on a post-graduation cross-country road trip, uh, in an online chat room, or browsing the shelves of a quaint British bookstore. Or they could take advantage of the economic arena literally designed to facilitate these interactions, the financial market. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall Macroeconomics. Just like your neighborhood shoe store is a market for shoes or your local pickle bookstore is a market for pickles and books, the financial markets are markets for exchanging funds. Financial markets can save Paloma and Joe quite a bit of time by being the hotspot to swap assets. There are a few different kinds of financial markets. One of the most famous is the stock market where little percentages of publicly traded companies called stocks are bought and sold. So if you were to buy stock in my patented barbecue blue cheese salad dressing company, you would technically own a little bit of my business for yourself. Now, the New York Stock Exchange is a physical marketplace located in scenic downtown NYC. But anywhere that you can log into your online account and exchange part of your money for part of someone else's company ownership, that's part of the stock market too. When companies sell stock, they get cash in the moment to spend on improvements. And as the company becomes more and more profitable, its stock value usually goes up. So if you sell your stock after that growth, it sells for a higher price and you get to make a chunk of change in return for supporting a bunch of white guys in Patagonia fleece vests. I mean, entrepreneurship. <laughs> but if the company fails, it means you're likely to lose all the money you've put in. That's why stocks are generally a high risk, high reward way to invest. Now, Paloma could take her $1,000 and buy stocks, but it's doubtful that she and Joe would ever lock eyes across the bustling floor of the stock exchange. That's because Joe's bread company probably isn't public yet, meaning it's still a small, privately owned business which can't sell stocks on public exchanges. And maybe Paloma wants a slightly less risky way to invest in the first place. In that case, she might consider the bond market. Bonds are sold by cities, countries, and large corporations when they're low on funds to borrow what they need to be sold back to the buyer when the bond matures or expires. Plus interest, of course. Compared to stocks, they're a dependable, if lower returning, way to invest your money. Since Joe is merely a man with a passion for pita, pretzels, and pan au chocolat, not a city, country, or large corporation, the bond market isn't our baker's first choice. Meanwhile, if Paloma used her $1,000 to purchase bonds, she'd be pretty much guaranteed that they'd be held safe and sound and earn some interest. But if she suddenly needed that money back before the bond matured, she'd have to sell early and be forced to forego some of the money that she would have made otherwise and risk getting less than she originally paid. Then there's the foreign exchange market where people exchange currencies like the US dollar for a certain amount of euros, yen, pounds, or other currency. If you're a recent grad backpacking across Europe to find yourself, you'll probably use the foreign exchange market to translate your money into the currency you need. You can't put down a US dollar for a Parisian baguette. But the foreign exchange market can also be a way to invest. If you anticipate a currency's value increasing in the future, you can exchange your money now at a lower rate to increase total purchasing power down the line. Since Paloma and Joe are neither footloose 22-year-olds nor international business tycoons, 
Odds are they won't meet in a train car traveling from Budapest to Vienna, sharing a magical night together before parting with plans to meet in the same spot six months later. Uh, I mean, the foreign exchange market. <laughs> For many investors though, these financial markets are the place to be. And if you are a big time investor, you're probably spending time in all of these arenas, not just one. But to meet the needs of everyday borrowers and lenders, the most practical financial market might also be the most familiar. It's the place that you and I might go to withdraw our grocery money and swap dollars for quarters to do laundry and deposit our hard earned paychecks and maybe grab a lollipop on the way out. That's right, I'm talking about banks. Banks serve as financial intermediaries where everyday borrowers and lenders can meet for all their borrowing and lending needs. Everyday borrowers and lenders like Joe and Paloma. It's a clear sunny day in Mattsburg, the day Paloma walks into Mattsburg Bank to deposit her $1,000. They inform her she'll receive 3% annual interest on her money. Then they put Paloma's money together with cash from other depositors to issue loans to other people. People like Joe who just so happens to be walking into the bank at that very moment. Much like the cake song, at Mattsburg Bank, they meet accidentally. They start to talk when he borrows her pen, to sign his loan papers, that is. That's right, the bank offers Joe just the loan he needs at a 7% interest rate, which means he'll eventually have to pay back more than what he originally took out. But by then, his bakery business will be bustling, so the added expense hopefully won't be too big a deal. The bank has to give depositors like Paloma 3% out of the 7% they reap off of Joe's loan, but they get to keep the remaining 4% for themselves to help them cover those business costs like keeping the lights on, paying the tellers, refilling the free pen supply, and buying more lollipops. But banks are for-profit businesses, so the goal is to always have some money left over after those lollipop fees. And often they're able to do that by capitalizing on their customers with the least amount of money. See, banks are sunshine and rainbows for people who have saved up a chunk of earnings, like Paloma, and would love to use their money to make a little more. But banks notoriously profit off of folks with less financial capital. This happens through the interest rate Joe will have to pay back on his loan, or the overdraft fee he'll get charged if his account dips below a certain balance, or the sky-high credit card interest he'll be stuck owing if he comes in late on a payment. In fact, when banks loan out their money, they actually charge more interest to those folks who already have more debt. So while they're a useful tool for borrowers and depositors alike, banks aren't lending out that money out of the goodness of their little banker hearts. They're doing it to make money themselves. And since banks are driven by profit motive, it might make sense for them to loan out as much as they possibly can to make back as much as they possibly can in that interest. But for the banking system to work, banks still have to manage risk. When it comes to banking, there are always two risk possibilities. All the proverbial Palomas could want their cash all at once, or a bunch of proverbial Joes could turn out their empty pockets and stop paying back their loans. Bank runs, where depositors want to withdraw more assets than the bank has on hand, aren't common, but can happen. Think uh, It's a Wonderful Life, or Mary Poppins, or what happened in real life after the stock market crash of Black Tuesday, which kicked off the Great Depression. Not to be confused with Black Friday, which kicks off some great deals. Or more recently, what happened to Silicon Valley Bank, when over a period of just two days, investors withdrew so many funds that the bank was left totally broke. Bank runs, plus other factors like shifty loaning practices, can lead to bank failures, where a bank totally collapses and has to be bailed out by either a larger private bank or the Fed. More on them in another episode. We obviously don't want our banks to fail. So it's important to make sure banks always have enough cash on hand to meet customers' needs. This is regulated by the Fed through something called the reserve requirement, which tells banks what percentage of deposits they need to keep on hand rather than loaning out to ensure they can allow withdrawals while the rest of their assets are tied up in investments. This percentage is known as the reserve ratio. In 2024, where I am right now, the Fed has set the reserve ratio at 0%, which kind of defeats the purpose. Another part of keeping a bank solvent is tracking a bank's loans and deposits, as well as the difference between the two. We can use a financial accounting document known as a bank balance sheet to observe how one bank or the whole banking system is doing, tracking things like the value of the loans and securities they hold and how much they're taking in as deposits. A bank balance sheet is generally divided into two columns. On the right, 
you'll see all the assets that the bank owns and which it uses to make money. To the left are liabilities, or all the things that a bank owes to creditors or depositors. A bank must have more assets than liabilities, meaning they've got a positive net worth, or else they'll shut down. When we fill out our bank balance sheet, we want both sides of the balance sheet to always balance each other. Hence the name. Kind of like when you balance your own budget at home. That makes sure that they always have the assets to offset their liabilities, which allows them to continue to operate and helps guarantee they won't go belly up. For banks like our good friends at Mattsburg Bank, that means recording each new deposit like Paloma's or loan like Joe's. When the bank gains new assets or has a new liability, both sides of the sheet have to balance. It's a big part of how banks manage their risks and make sure that they're accepting and loaning money responsibly. In the end, Financial markets like banks provide some really important services. They can help people like you, me, and Paloma keep our money safe and make some interest while doing it. They also help people who need money now, like Joe. Economic growth would happen a lot slower if everyone had to scrounge through the couch cushions and save up for years to make their first major purchase. At the same time, many financial markets, like the stock market, require funds to participate in the first place and banks profit off of those without their own capital, perpetuating economic inequalities. They charge high interest rates on the money they loan out, plus high fees to accounts without a certain amount of money inside or credit card holders who fall short on a monthly payment. Thanks to their chance meeting in the financial markets, things turned out pretty good for Paloma and Joe. At least once they cleared up the dramatic third act misunderstanding and met on top of the Empire State Building for their happily ever after. But for everyone to have their financial rom-com storybook ending, we need effective regulations to make sure the banking system works to fuel economic growth for all. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full study hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like. Tell us when you opened your first bank account and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.